You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC-88 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC-88, the most popular Japanese PC series of the 1980s. If you're interested in classic game music, then one name you've probably come across is the master of FM sound himself, Yuzo Koshiro, most well known for the Streets of Rage series on the Genesis slash Mega Drive. But did you know that Yuzo Koshiro got his start on the PC-88? Working for Nihon Falcom, he composed or partially composed the soundtracks for all of these games. Though he also did sound for a few non-Falcom games while he was working at the company, it wasn't until after Ease 2 that he left permanently, along with his sister, graphic designer Ayano Koshiro, and went freelance for a couple of years, before starting his own company Ancient in 1990. During this brief freelance period, the first game Yuzo and his sister worked on is known to be one of the best games on the PC-88, and the subject of this video, The Scheme, released by Bothtech in 1988. Bothtech is a company that released quite a few games on the PC-88 and other platforms of the era, but in the case of The Scheme, they were mostly just the publisher. The game was actually developed by Onionsoft a game development group centered around one man, Yasushi Takeda. He's credited as Onion Takeda in the scheme, and soon after he started going by the moniker Onitama. In addition to many amateur doujin games, Onionsoft also made a few games for professional software publishers, including both texts The Scheme, but I think that's about enough background. Let's take out the game. Okay, I don't know if there's any way I can accurately describe the game's rarity, but this is widely considered to be one of the most sought after PC-88 titles, and you definitely won't find it for cheap. The game has a simple white cover, where the protagonist is fighting against some sort of monster. The back is one of the few places where the game's story is ever mentioned. The setting is the distant future on the planet Lair, where an evil cult called the Hellstones is hatching an evil plot, or scheme if you will. A clever and diabolical scheme. You take control of the planet's king, Mardu Sulaire, in order to take down the cult's leader, the mysterious Hardy. Let's open it up. The outer cardboard sleeve is covering an aluminum box, similar to one that might contain a fancy assortment of chocolates or Christmas candies. It has a cool Bothtech logo on the corner, and the address where the company was located in Shibuya. The box opens on its hinges to reveal the sweet goodies, a manual and two floppy disks. The manual has an even shorter version of the story and a list of items and bosses. This page has an incomplete map of the planet Lair, asking you to draw the rest yourself. No way I'm writing anything in this old manual. This is the only time I think I've seen a PC-88 manual that says expressly not to run the game in the faster 8 MHz mode, so I'll go ahead and change my BIOS settings to 4 MHz before we get started. Another thing somewhat unique to this game is that instead of having a disc 1 and 2, or A and B, the scheme has a red disc and a blue disc, and it doesn't matter where you insert each disc, it works either way, meaning that both discs are bootable, and I guess the game just figures itself out after that. So, let's insert the discs now. Upon booting the game, the first thing that comes up is the music mode selection. So, what's this? Well, special mode is for the PC-88 Soundboard 2, which is the newer PC-88 FM soundboard, featuring more sound channels, ADPCM, and stereo sound. Normal mode is for the PC-88's original FM soundboard, which is actually called the PC-8801-11, but I'll be using the slang term Soundboard 1 for simplicity's sake. So the game supports either soundboard, but why the choice here? Most PC-88 games detect your soundboard automatically, meaning that normally there's no way to hear the Soundboard 1 version on a Soundboard 2, even though it's fully backward compatible. Well, unlike other games, the scheme doesn't just have an enhanced Soundboard 2 soundtrack, but rather a completely different soundtrack for each soundboard, with only a couple of melodies shared between them. 
Apparently Yuzo Koshiro loved making FM tunes so much, he made too many to fit in one game. I found several people online recommending that I play through the game at least twice in order to fully enjoy both soundtracks, including the author of the walkthrough I was using who says, that's an order. Yes, sir. So I selected normal here for my first playthrough, but all the music you'll be hearing throughout this video is from special mode, unless otherwise noted. Many have pointed out that the game's protagonist looks suspiciously similar to Adol from Ease, and this only seems all the more suspicious knowing that the game was made right after Kashiro worked on Ease 2 and left Falcon. Interpret that however you will. If you wait on this title screen, you'll get a credit sequence, but let's press space and move on. The main menu of the scheme is unnecessarily hard to control. It looks like it's intended for a mouse, but it says right in the manual not to connect one. And though this game uses the gamepad, you can't use it to control this cursor. The number pad is literally the only option. If you select game mode, it'll just say cannot, so you have to go to the name mode first. Here this would be great if you could use the keyboard, but again, this slow cursor controlled with the number pad is your only option. Oh well, it's just a minor inconvenience in an otherwise good game. The last option, kill mode, is to delete an existing game, in case that wasn't clear. Now let's select game mode and then the name we just created to start. So here's the game itself gradually materializing onto the screen. What is the scheme, sir? The scheme is a side view action game. You can walk, crouch, and jump. Your main weapon is waiting to be picked up right here on the first screen. The protagonist attacks using a force shot that according to the story and cover illustration comes from his right hand. Since there is no attack animation, it had might as well come from his chest though. As you can see, the game doesn't have scrolling, but that doesn't hurt the game at all in my opinion. It's meant to be played screen by screen, and as you may know, scrolling wasn't really the PC-88's strong suit. The game plays to the system's strengths. One cool thing you'll notice right away is that power-ups fly out and bounce everywhere when an enemy is destroyed. It's a cool and fun effect, though it can make collecting the power-ups a little bit troublesome at times. The power-up system is simple. You have both an energy and a force indicator. Energy is your HP and force is experience. Collect a certain amount of force and the level indicator below will gain a bar and your attack strength will go up. The bouncing power-ups come in blue and red. Blue is energy and red is force, and the Roman numerals indicate the exact number the power-ups will give you. That's it. So in this brief first part of the game, taking place on the surface of Planet Lair, you can walk either to the left or right. Go all the way to the right and you'll simply find a closed gate. Go all the way to the left and you'll find a boss, this weird blue spaceman who pops up and down out of the ground. Defeat it and you'll not only get a nice barrage of power-ups, but, you guessed it, the gate at the right end of the stage will now open. Pass through the gate and the BGM changes as we enter the next area. The rest of the game will be a maze-like journey, taking place below the surface of Planet Lair. Once again, the protagonist is the king of Planet Lair, named Marusu Lair. I can't confirm this, but I think he may be named after a Japanese whiskey. Why does whiskey keep coming up on this channel? When I google the name Marusureya, the first thing that comes up is a whiskey from the Japanese brand Mars called Mars Rare Old. The way it's written in katakana is identical to the character in the scheme, except it has the word old at the end of course. Japanese fiction creators often use things around them when coming up with katakana names, like the Slayers character Remy Martin, so it's not unlikely at all that they got the name from a whiskey. I'm gonna go ahead and call the protagonist Mars Lair from here on. Japanese experts out there will notice that this isn't how the word Mars is usually written in katakana, but it is the way Mars Whiskey is written. So back to the game. The one thing about the lack of scrolling is that you'll sometimes get caught off guard by enemies who knock you back to the previous screen, which causes the enemies to respawn. A bit irritating sometimes, but definitely not game ruining. It helps to keep you on your toes, in fact. If you search around this first underground area, you can find an E-Pack which will raise your energy max by 100. 
There's also an L pack, which will raise your attack level by one bar. It's actually impossible to get to the maximum attack level by collecting force power-ups alone. You'll need to also collect these L packs. Though I managed to find some of these things on my own, I also found confusing areas like an infinite passageway that constantly drains your HP. I felt pretty lost already in this very first underground area. There's a very good map and walkthrough of the game available in Japanese, which I'll put links to in the description. Use Google Translate or whatever you have to do, because it's quite well made. The map is a text file that's a little hard to view, so if you want, you can just take a screenshot here to make your own. If you prefer, there's a much easier to read map here, but it's a map only and doesn't have the letter markers you'll need for the walkthrough. The walkthrough will show you where to find this red shot power up, which will double the amount of shots you can fire at once. And then there's this tentacled boss that will leave you the unicorn key. This will allow you to open the unicorn gate and move on to a new area. In this area, you'll find some walls that are too high to jump over, and a dragon who doesn't move and can't be destroyed. Eventually, you'll find the Lizard Man boss, who will give you an all new weapon to replace your old one. With this one, you can basically just hold down the button for turbo fire. Now, if you go back to that dragon, it's alive and you can destroy it. You'll then get the Strong Man key, which will open the Strong Man gate. This area has some much tougher enemies than previously encountered, but it's the only area where they'll leave this rare power-up that looks like a down arrow. It awards you a whopping 16 force points, so this is a good area for leveling if you're so inclined. The area also has a fallaway floor, which can be really annoying if you don't manage to jump over it. You'll have to get past some pretty damaging enemies in order to get back up. Luckily, if you die in the scheme, it will just take you to a continue or save screen, and when you start back up, you'll be at the entrance of the area where you died, with all your force points still intact, so even when you die, you're still gaining experience. On the other side of the fallaway floor is another E-Pack, and nearby you'll find a spiky shelled monster, but this monster isn't for killing, it's for standing on. The room beyond has an armor power-up that will decrease the amount of damage you take for the rest of the game. Then, in an area above that, you'll find what looks like a dead end. But if you simply jump at the wall, you can go right through it. This might be one of the hardest parts to figure out without a walkthrough. But as a hint, you might notice your shots go right through this wall. Also, you've got to remember, this was 1988. If anyone spent as much time messing around with this game as my generation did with the original Metroid, then I'm sure they would have eventually figured this out. On the other side, you'll find another area with more walls to pass through, but you'll be familiar with this trick by now. Eventually, you'll find the Infinity Key, which allows you to pass through the infinite passageway I found earlier. On the other side of that is the Dragon Key for the Dragon Gate. Here's another one of the tougher sections of the game to get through. These blob enemies take so many hits and fire so many shots all over the place, you'll often lose less HP by jumping past them instead of killing them. Though these falling blocks seem like they fall too quickly to be killed, they're actually the same blocks respawning over and over again from the ceiling, so if you keep shooting, you'll eventually clear the screen. But once you get to screens where you have both the falling blocks plus other enemies, again I found that you'll take less damage if you just try to get through without killing them. Eventually, you'll get to an E-Pack, which by the way, not only raises your maximum energy, it also restores it to the max. There are two more items you need to find in this dangerous area, which are an L-Pack and the Jump Boots. The Jump Boots are harder to get to without running out of HP, so you might want to use this rare opportunity with your energy maxed out to grab them first. It's really hard to get everything in this area without dying and being sent all the way back. It took me quite a few tries, and you'll only get one try where your energy gets maxed out here from the E-Pack. Don't waste it. So now that we have the Jump Boots, we can jump higher and get past some of these walls we found earlier. This is this Metroidvania's only example of what they call ability gating. The rest of this game uses literal gating. So past the high jump walls, there's an eyeball boss. At first I thought this was really hard, since it keeps appearing so briefly you can hardly shoot it, and sometimes it appears right on top of you. But I eventually figured out that where it appears is random, and it seldom appears near the edge of the screen. So stand over here and suddenly, this boss is not hard at all it will give you the final key of the game. But before the final area, you'll want to make sure you're fully prepared. 
If you've been getting all the E and L packs shown in the walkthrough, you should already be at the maximum attack level and have an energy max of 800, but it's still possible to raise Mars's energy max even further via a couple of secrets shown in the walkthrough. First, there's a room near the eyeball boss where you found an E pack earlier. In the upper right corner of the room, you'll find a spot that sounds like it's taking damage when you shoot it. Keep shooting it for what seems like forever, and eventually, a coconut will appear. Collecting it will raise your energy max by 350 points. Actually, you should probably collect this earlier when you get the E-Pack in this room. That'll make defeating the eyeball boss even easier. The second secret way to raise your energy max is way back in the above ground area from the beginning of the game. Here you may remember these seemingly indestructible spike creatures you had to jump over. Well, it turns out they're actually destructible. They just take an insane number of hits. If you have the maximum attack level now, or close to it, you can kill one of these by shooting at it for a little over 30 seconds. The first time, and only the first time you kill one of these, your energy max will be raised by another 100 points. You may want to do this a little earlier in the game if you happen to be in the neighborhood and are already at one of the highest attack levels. Now let's finally use the last key to enter the final area. You've got falling spikes to watch out for, and there's one screen where you'll want to make sure you fall to this passageway on the left side. If you fall to the bottom, you'll hit a dead end where you'll have no choice but to die. Successfully get to the passageway on the left, and you'll fight the final mini-boss. This one is kinda tough, but just keep trying to move out of the way of that annoying gun on the ceiling while firing at the demon head, and if you do well enough, it should die before you do. Killing it will not only give you a full meter of energy to fight the end boss, but also raise your max by another 100, giving you the game's absolute energy max of 1350. You fall down into the maze-like final area. It has repeating passageways, but you should be able to get through it using one of the maps I showed earlier. It's impossible to get permanently stuck here, so just keep at it. You have to go through the repeating section at least once to get to the highest point then fall down to this passageway on the left. You'd think you could just keep holding left to get in here, but that doesn't seem to work. Instead, you need to aim for this platform nearby, and then do a quick hop from here by lightly tapping the jump button. Now we can finally meet the mysterious leader of the Hellstone's cult, Hardy. This boss throws basically everything in the kitchen sink at you. You've got squares of shots expanding outward, and if you hit his tail, your own shots will be reflected back, and they can damage you. And if that wasn't enough, your HP also drains automatically throughout the battle. This may make things feel hopeless, but keep avoiding as many shots as you can, taking every brief opportunity you get to shoot Hardy, and you should win eventually, at least after a few tries. Hardy is finally defeated, and the long battle with the cult is coming to its end. The planet lair is finally on its way to peace again. Then there's the credits sequence. In addition to the Kashiros and Onion Takeda, another person worth mentioning is Shinobu Hayashi, who later joined Koshiro's company Ancient, and was the lead programmer of Sonic the Hedgehog from Master System and Game Gear, which you may know is another game with Yuzo Koshiro music, as well as graphics by his sister. 1988, both tech. The end. That's all for the scheme. Overall, I think the scheme is a great game, but one thing that could have maybe made it a little better is adding support for 8 MHz mode, for people with later model PC-88s like mine. At the time of this game's release, 8 MHz PC-88s had already been around for years, though admittedly, most PC-88 users still had one of the old 4 MHz models, which is why this and many games continued to target 4 MHz machines. The scheme, however, doesn't even let you start the game in 8 MHz mode. Of course, supporting 8 MHz machines would have meant reprogramming the game so that it no longer uses CPU cycles for the timing, but considering how big an issue slowdown becomes at many points in this one, I think it would have been well worth the effort. Another thing that could have improved the game is having an actual story. Unlike most PC-88 games I've covered, there's no dialogue and no opening sequence. Imagine characters who appear and talk to Mars before or after the bosses, who gradually reveal the Hellstone cult's shocking plot. 
But on the other hand, not every game has to have a story, and you have to remember that on systems like the NES at the time, a simple story in the manual and a few lines at the ending was pretty much par for the course. On the bright side, with the only Japanese text being the few lines at the end, this game doesn't need an English patch at all to be enjoyed. But hands down, the best part of the game is of course the soundtrack. You get not only one great soundtrack to enjoy, but two. The normal mode using the Soundboard 1 sounds pretty similar to Kashiro's previous work with Falcom, and many tracks wouldn't sound out of place at all in East or Sorcerian. The special mode, on the other hand, uses the Soundboard 2's ADPCM to create more of a dance sound on many tracks, which sounds like the beginnings of Kashiro's early 90s work in games like Streets of Rage. <laughs> There's a sound test code, but unfortunately it's only for the normal version of the soundtrack. There's also a secret alternative BGM for the main menu. And lastly, there's another sound test with 80 unused tracks composed by the staff other than Koshiro. There are more than enough tracks here to fill an entire game, or three, and I can't help but wonder if some of these tracks were intended to be the scheme's soundtrack prior to when Koshiro was brought on board or something. Or maybe it's just a bunch of junk tracks the developers made while screwing around, I don't know. They're all definitely much lower quality than Koshiro's work. But wait, there's more! Now the only antidote to a zany scheme is an even zanier scheme! A grander scheme than this? <laughs> <laughs> no, a simpler one. A year after the scheme, an unofficial Dojin sequel was made by the same team of developers and sold only once at a comic market in 1989. The game attempted to imitate the parallax scrolling effect of Ease 3, Wanderers from Ease, and was thus named Wanderers from Super Scheme. Again, Ease 3 was the first Ease game that Koshiro wasn't involved in, and the character looks a lot like Adol, so make of that what you will. The game features more new Soundboard 2 tracks by Yuzo Koshiro, and graphics by his sister. At first glance, the game looks a lot like the scheme, but with scrolling. In actuality, it doesn't play the same at all. In fact, it plays a little more like a Shinobi game, which kind of feels right since it sounds like one anyway. This game was released around the same time that Kashiro did the Super Shinobi for Mega Drive, also known as the Revenge of Shinobi in the West. Some of the sound effects here even sound like they were ripped directly from that game. So my theory is that the super part in the title is not just a random word thrown in there, but actually directly referring to the Super Shinobi. So this game is kind of a mixture of the character from the scheme, the scrolling from Ease 3, and the gameplay from The Revenge of Shinobi. Mars throws throwing stars at a bunch of cows, who are annoyingly placed too low to be hit due to the lack of a crouch ability. Man, this would have been so much better if it just played like the original The Scheme. By the way, the enemies in this first stage are based on another Onion Soft Dojin game where you play a flying saucer picking up cows. The second part of the first stage is especially cool since there's four directional scrolling and you have to travel downward. Anyway, this game is really unfairly hard and apparently few people have finished it, so I'm going to show you how, right now, in Wanderers from Super Scheme, the walkthrough. And I promise this will be entertaining, whether you're planning on playing the game or not. A lot of people seem to have trouble with this first boss, but there's a stupidly easy trick to it. Whenever you're facing away from the saucer, it flies in the opposite direction. So to keep the saucer at a distance, you just turn away whenever it gets too close. Be patient and you can destroy it without taking much damage. The castle theme stage is probably the best looking part of the game. These graphics are kind of wasted here. There isn't anything too difficult to figure out until you get to the boss. I hate this stupid Tetris boss. 
or takoris actually, it says takoris. You just need to shoot at the box enough times while also shooting down some of the Tetris pieces coming at you in order to avoid taking too much damage. The slowdown here is terrible, and a lot of my button presses don't seem to get registered at all, leading to a lot of lost opportunities to shoot. Holding the button down a little longer each time rather than tapping quickly seems to help a little, but what really helps is playing the game in 8 MHz mode instead of 4. Now, this game is definitely intended to be played at 4 MHz, but unlike the scheme, at least the game will start in 8 MHz mode. Weirdly, rather than just making the game faster, more of the button presses seem to get registered in 8 MHz, counterintuitively making the game easier at this speed. But still, 4 MHz definitely looks correct, and I'm going to finish it that way. Do your best, and Takoris will go down. The next stage in the lava mines has some annoying parts, but it's all pretty self-explanatory, until the boss. Again, there are similar slowdown problems here. In 8 MHz mode, you can actually just keep shooting at it. Even when it comes too close and starts hurting you, just keep shooting and it'll go down if you have a full life meter. 4 MHz is another story. You need to make your way to the other side while the boss's arms are still not fully formed. Then it just stupidly keeps moving toward your former position on the left so you've got it made once you get over here. The final stage with all these robots is guaranteed to kick your ass. The first part is difficult, but pretty self-explanatory. The second part has these terrible laser shooting robot bugs. Some of them don't shoot very much, but the others are constantly shooting in a random rhythm. The only saving grace here is this one up, revealed by taking out this one in the upper right corner of the stage. Next, it looks like a dead end, but the way forward is hidden here in the bottom right corner of the stage. Then we get to the single hardest spot in the game. You'll probably die here a bunch of times, but you can keep collecting the 1-up from earlier in order to get infinite tries. This thing is constantly shooting random lasers. You can either try and get lucky by accidentally jumping up there during a brief instant when it happens to not be shooting. Pretty much impossible to do on purpose or attempt this maneuver where you get knocked backward onto the platform while facing the opposite direction. Then jump right the heck out of there and onto the next part of the stage. At first I thought this part was also impossible. Try to take these laser guys head on at close range and you'll inevitably die before they do. You also can't jump over them. The secret is that the range of their lasers is only slightly further than that of your throwing stars so stay just out of range, then take every opening you get to move forward and fire a couple of shots before retreating. You can tell from the sound effects whether you're hitting them or not. With a little patience, you'll get past these guys and grab the only life power up in the game. Now it's on to the final boss, which is surprisingly easy compared to what we've just been through. Don't bother trying to kill these two laser bugs. I'm pretty sure they're indestructible. Just position yourself up here on this platform and take your opportunities to jump and hit the boss when it comes down, all while doing your best to avoid the lasers. The ending has the game's credits accompanied by the same BGM you've been hearing throughout the stages, and when it's over, there's a quick music mode. The game only has five tracks, consisting of one stage BGM and four boss themes. I kind of wish it was the other way around. One of the boss themes is actually composed by one of the other programmers, not Koshiro. So congratulations if you can manage to finish Wanderers from Super Scheme, cause while I may have made it look easy, it's stupidly hard. Clearly they didn't try very hard to refine the gameplay, since it was only a short dojin game made to be distributed in limited quantities. Honestly sir, you just don't put the effort into your schemes that you used to. Nowadays, the game is available for free on Onionsoft's homepage or on the website Project Egg if you pay their monthly fee. By the way, Project Egg was partially created by the remnants of Bothtech, and the site's name and mascot come from the Bothtech game Eggy. Wanderers from Super Scheme may be terrible as a game, but it's a great tech demo for the PC-88, showing off graphics that could have been delivered in more PC-88 platformers had developers put their minds to it. Putting aside the weird unofficial sequel, the scheme is a very decent Metroidvania from 1988 that I wouldn't hesitate to recommend if it looks like something you'd enjoy. It's certainly not a perfect game or even the greatest game for the PC-88, but since the game was never ported to any other systems, I'm going to go ahead and call it the greatest PC-88 exclusive, 
or the greatest I've found so far anyway. Your mileage may vary if, for instance, you prefer RPGs, but the scheme is certainly a game I enjoyed playing through twice. It's perfect for speedrunning, and I wouldn't really mind playing through it a third time right now. Thanks for watching this episode of PC88 Paradise. It was supported by members on Patreon and YouTube, as well as viewers like you. Thanks for everyone for their continued support. I'll get back to you with another video soon.